Next, ladies and gentlemen, to address the audience, we have with us a seasoned professional with almost two decades of consulting experience across multiple geographies. He's also a key member of the KPMG's Global Building Construction and Real Estate Sector Steering Group. Please help me welcome the partner and head for Asian Corridor and Real Estate Sector, KPMG in India, Mr. Neeraj Bansal. Could we have a huge round of applause, ladies and gentlemen? We have with us Mr. Neeraj Bansal. Presentation. Yes. How will we flip that? Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, pleasure to be here uh, amongst everyone who's known in the industry, as well as uh, you know, for a very important conference as well. You know, from the point of view of two sessions that we're doing today late in the day on the affordable housing and the RERA perspective over there. While we get the presentation up, I think uh, we're just setting up a small context in terms of the today's discussion. So just summarizing some of the key indicators from a real estate point of view and some trends which are emerging right now and also from the point of view of just a short overview on the residential side of it and then in terms of the commercial reality. And that's how we summarize the you know session around that. Okay. So you guys do that? Yeah, that's okay. No worries. Will you put that? Yeah. Is it visible to the audience? No. Okay. Sure, sure. So while we get the presentation up uh, there, I think the you know uh, from a driver's perspective, we look at it. The there are three main drivers that are driving the growth from a real estate side of it in India. You know, so when you look at the urbanization trend, which is the biggest and the most important trend uh, across this entire region as well. Whether you look at South Asia, whether you look at India, point of view there. Uh, you know, so when you look at the urbanization side of it, they're almost like uh, in India side of things, almost 12 million people who are getting urbanized on a yearly basis. So we're looking at a explosive population growth support the urbanization trend which is fueling the uh, you know the growth in the urban requirements as well on the real estate side of it and uh, expectation is that by 2050 we'll have 900 million people versus 400 or million people living in the urban centers which are there today so by 2030 we are looking at about 580 million people and by 2050 we'll touch this number of 900 million people and if you look at the perspective that uh, you know, typically a household size in India is about 4 to 4.2 uh, per person, uh, per family, uh, you know, there. So this means a very explosive growth in terms of the housing demand which will come in from a residential side of it there. And uh, with the young population uh, that we'll have with the age of 28 years as a median side of it, you know, so the, you know, the age of uh, people actually owning a house and wanting to get up a new house as well has fallen drastically to 25, 28 years of age, which means that, you know, there is much more uh, demand coming in because of the nuclear housing as well and also uh, individuals kind of getting married and moving out to uh, locations which are individual homes over there. This is where the sector is getting benefited or will get benefited in the longer run, where we expect that, you know, the, from an uh, employment perspective, by 2022, the sector emerges as the largest uh, employer in terms of the people side of it there, which is almost touching 75 million uh, by 2022 over there. In terms of the construction market, we'll be the largest, third largest construction market in the world by again 2024, 2025, you know, where we're looking at a market size to get, of, get to about a trillion dollars over there, which is a, a humongous size of, uh, from a construction side of it, which is why we see the fuel of the fact that there are overseas construction firms which are vying for this buy and market share in India and entering the market as well, uh, while the, some of the other countries are also experiencing some of these growth factors in the, especially in the South Asian region, uh, India continues to have a dominance, you know, from a market share point of view. And uh, all of this will also help in terms of uh, the fact that uh, Indian economy, we're looking at that in the next 10 to 12 years uh, to grow by almost five times to become the third largest economy in the world, uh, which would mean that, you know, from a real estate side of it as well, there would be a contribution to GDP which will double, you know, to by 15% over there. So from a macro point of view, economic indicators, there are some good positive uh, indicators are in place at the current time. 
from a opportunities and real estate side the government has launched a number of initiatives that all of us are aware of that you know with the housing for all initiative with the make in india initiative with the you know urban cities in terms of urban smart cities aspect of it so there is at an overall level there is almost like a 4 trillion dollars of infrastructure requirement which is there in india right now in terms of next 5 7 years if you look at it and which which is what is uh, you know giving the opportunity across the value chain in real estate it's not only for developers it's for you know people who are engaged in various parts of the uh, construction industry over there and if you look at just housing for all in terms of the affordable housing side of it so there is a, a lot more discussion required you know which we would hope that you know happens also in the next panel is also on the the fact that what does affordable housing mean for non real estate companies you know with the fact that so much of requirement going to come from cement industry point of view from a steel point of view there and also with changes in technology which going to happen you know in terms of fast moving construction that we need to do so that requires uh, a wider discussion and also involvement of many more uh, participate in the real estate industry and then what we will say only by developers and private equity let's say engaged on real estate if we look at in terms of you know some of the trends which are coming up you know because of these uh, opportunities and also the expansion which is happening so the operating models from a real estate side the traditional model uh, is undergoing a lot of change especially with rera coming in now you know there is a need for having more leaner companies focused on core competencies in terms of development side of it and also in terms of you know leading the you know getting a uh, uh, proper ecosystem developed to see that the projects are conceptualized appropriately and also delivered uh, in time so we we would see that uh, you know the a lot more support getting done by corporatization of the developer companies over there and which is where we finding that lot more mnas joint ventures jdas and lean development models will come in place as well and this will also be corroborated with the fact that you know the from a construction technology standpoint also the changes being witnessed and also the within the companies uh, you know the project management offices or the program management offices are trying to shake up shape now and this would be useful uh, for them to see that there is a very strong oversight on the project delivery uh, which is of very strong importance uh on the regulatory changes been said many much but you know all of us have kind of faced it with the you know almost whether you call it three tsunamis or whether you call it three heart attacks you know whichever we look at it with demonetization with rera gst coming almost in succession of each other uh you know the industry is still uh you know adjusting to these requirements and also uh, especially on the gst side there are enough complications to kind of understand and uh, comprehend uh, which is where one is hoping that you know government gets more clarity on it and uh, one is able to uh, Uh, comply with those requirements uh, with the benami property act and the insolvency especially in this delhi region with uh, you know with the insolvency that we have had with one of the developers over there has been one of the most uh, talking topics uh, right now on the financing side as well with the you know uh, with the changes in the regulation on reit side of it there is a strong positivity hope that uh, by next year we have the first reit coming in uh, from a india perspective there and uh, there are obviously the filing has happened so you know there is a movement which is going to happen around that and uh, cmbs has also come up as an option for the commercial property developers over there and uh, in terms of uh, residential side of it uh, you know primarily the focus has been shifted towards affordable housing and also uh, we are seeing some trends in terms of student housing coming up as a important element there and in uh, office space especially the co-working spaces is a very exciting uh, point wherein uh, two or three units have started to come up in a better manner and this is an emerging space which is uh, exciting we finding that you know the is the institutionalized developers as well as uh, you know the from an end user point of view as well there is a lot of interest in this space and we'll continue to see that how people use this model uh, to leverage it from the costing point of view as well as from an operational flexibility uh, perspective there moving to some of the uh, a very quick uh, thing on the affordable housing perspective there can we move to the next slide please <clears throat> that uh, i mean this is a very very ambitious uh, program by the government uh, you know with the fact that we are looking at almost 5 uh, crore houses to be uh, prepared and developed and ready uh, by 2022 uh, in which uh, we are looking uh, you know a, a segment of both rural and the urban side of it uh, in our estimate uh, when we did the study in 2014 uh, with the current shortage also with the increase in supply required you know uh, we estimated that there is a shortage of 11 crore houses is against the government uh, setback of about 5 to 6 crores is what the government is looking at but that doesn't take care of the new requirements will come up as well so every year uh, because of the population increase uh, there is almost 2.5 to 3 million new houses required in urban areas and which is a requirement which has to get to addressed as well apart from the shortage which is already existing 
So if we keep the uh, government targets of two crore urban houses in mind and three crores of Grameen houses in mind over there, uh, and we take the timelines of like a couple of months here and there, we are looking at uh, that we need almost seven and a half lakh houses plus to be built every month. Uh, which is the kind of a very, very tall order, uh, which is the government has got in on itself. And this is only about five crore houses. This doesn't take care of the full requirement. So, you know, if you take the full requirement into account, you need almost 15, 16 lakh houses to be built every month, uh, delivered. Uh, that's how you can meet the target. So, currently, uh, we are facing a lot of challenges. What is typically happening is that the governments come up with many changes. There are improvements which are happening, uh, you know, in parts. So while there are changes that have been done, but the full ecosystem has not come up, you know, from an affordable housing point of view. So the scarcity of land continues to be there. The challenges on the approval side continues to be there. And the issue is not getting resolved effectively. Recently, uh, last month, uh, at a conference, the uh, the housing minister had announced the PPP housing uh, scheme over there. So there are eight models which have come up on that. Two for the private land in terms of the extension of CLSS and also on the central assistance part of it. And the six schemes have been done from a public uh, uh, housing point of view there, where the government gives the land and you know, the development happens by the developer. Uh, in this, uh, there are only two models, which is where the developer has a direct relationship with the buyer in terms of the seventh and the eighth, uh, wherein uh, the buyer is uh, supposed to interact directly with the developer. But in this case, uh, what we find is that the uh, potentially the extension of CLSS model and the central assistance model are the ones which will get favored by the developers more, and maybe the cross-subsidized model, you know, wherein the developers uh, are required to uh, build a certain percentage of housing on the EWS side of it, and also cross-subsidize it based on the housing which has been done on the other part of the land parcel over there. So the higher income housing subsidizing the lower income housing over there, which we believe that out of the eight, the three or four are the ones which will be more favored by the developers there. A lot still need to be done uh, from the point of view of land reform point of view there, because the title of the land continues to be a big challenge. So digitization uh, is happening at a very lower pace uh, right now. Uh, that is something which requires a bigger push. On the streamlining of approvals, again, uh, we have seen a tardy progress. We've had, uh, you know, in bits and pieces, uh, certain states have moved forward and have rationalized some of the regulations over there. But again, uh, till the time, uh, you know, the affordable housing doesn't get a, you know, a specific clear uh, roadmap in terms of approval process, the cost for getting the approval and the time for getting the approval continues to hamper the, uh, you know, a growth in this segment uh, there. And uh, the development norms, uh, multiple places, uh, one has seen that the development norms are not in line with the requirements for affordable housing, whether it's the parking norms, whether it is the density norms over there. So while we are promoting the affordable housing, if the norms do not change pace uh, with the requirements part of it, the viability of the projects doesn't come through. And that is the reason why you find the uh, developers not focusing on this segment uh, effectively. Government itself, in terms of building the institutional capacity, in terms of uh, being able to come up with those many projects, is not been great. So there are challenges in terms of the capacity of the, uh, you know, the urban local bodies and also with the ministerial people there to see that how they can expand uh, that requirement and make it a very uh, smooth process. So something which was done for, let's say, the power uh, ministry part of it is something which is required from a real estate side of it as well to see that you know we have a packaged out projects which can be easily understood the risks under them, also the commercial side of things there, and also standardizing designs also from an affordable housing would help to see that there is more offtake of such projects by the private uh, contractors and builders over there. And uh, of course, on the rental housing point of view, uh, there is a, uh, we've been speaking or uh, hearing about it, that there is a, you know, the policy will come up uh, sooner on that. Uh, that is something which is important because globally, uh, ownership is not what is linked to real estate uh, as a primary thing. So in India, we have always that thing that we need to own the house, but in uh, most of the geographic countries, there is 35 to 40 to 55 percent of the housing is in the rental side of it, you know, wherein uh, one is able to ensure that there is a uh, house to everyone without uh, let's say a down payment and other issues getting linked to it there. So that is something which we need a, a stronger push from an India point of view as well. And the some of the benefits on the affordable housing uh, public-private partnership scheme which has been announced recently, one will see there is one element of rental housing also in that. So one will see that how it pans out in the next few months uh, as it goes forward. 
On the other side, <coughs> commercial reality has been a big play. Uh, you know that is something which has been a uh, you know very very positive spin to that, uh, which has seen a high growth uh, aspect of it. So with 30 35 million square feet of uh, annual absorption, with low vacancies and also you know higher uh, supply coming in on the commercial uh, office space. So you know that is something is uh, been a very positive uh, requirement, and uh, also that has attracted a lot of the foreign investors as well from a commercial housing point of view there. Uh, so retail space uh, again, uh, you know, with the higher absorptions, with almost three million square feet plus getting added every year uh, in the last four years, uh, that's been an exciting space and expected to continue to do so. With GST and uh, you know e-commerce and other uh, uh, like drivers fueling the housing, uh, fueling the warehousing stock uh, in India, uh, so when we're seeing that there will be more and more organized warehousing space coming up. And uh, that is a very, very important uh, you know, segment which is emerging in terms of the interest from both domestic and the foreign investors as well. Some quick numbers, if I may just kind of go through uh, on the institutional investments part of it. Uh, this has been an exciting space. Uh, you know, this year particularly has seen a record year of investments announced uh, with the uh, participation of the foreign investors over there. With almost $5 billion already announced and one would expect about another uh, billion or two getting signed up you know, in this quarter. So this is a record year. Uh, last year as well, we had almost $5 billion of investments. So combined, uh, these two years have been uh, you know, very big from a real estate investments point of view, from India point of view there, which also reflects the sentiment that you know, the valuation side of it and also in terms of the growth story there is an entire uh, there and you know the foreign investors are able to see it uh, and also time it accordingly a lot of these investments have been driven into the office space primarily by the sovereign wealth funds and the pension funds over there and uh, in terms of deal sizes as well uh, you know one has seen that there is almost a doubling of the size so from almost 56 million odd deal sizes this with the the new foreign investment has happened in the office space the deal size is almost doubled to about 111 million uh, per deal in the last uh, four years. So where is this investment, uh, you know, coming from? Uh, if you just divide that, you know, we see that the share of the banks, uh, you know, has been really going down. So in terms of the lending by the developers to the bank segment, uh, you know, at the in the overall four-year period, it stands at 37 percent, which is quite linked to the private equity investment of 38 percent over there. But if you look at the share at an individual level, then uh, at an individual year level in 2016, the bank's investment uh, or bank's share. Of of lending has really gone down from 83% in 2013 to 17% over there. So one is, of course, that the market size of investment has increased. At the same time, the bank's reluctance to lend to the sector, and also with the NPS that our banks are going through, and also with some of the challenges that the you know, sectors kind of face through. So the lending from the banking sector has reduced uh, for the sector significantly. But this has been uh, kind of, you can say, replaced or added more by the uh, you know, kind of investments done by NBFCs and also with the sovereign wealth funds and pension funds, which have uh, you know, increasingly uh, looked at Indian real estate as a, another alternative avenue for them, uh, for the investment side of it there. In terms of uh, where this money is coming from, uh, you know, apart from the money which has come from Netherlands and Hong Kong recently, uh, but if you look at the overall uh, picture, then almost 60% of the investment is coming from three locations, which is in terms of the Canada, Singapore, and uh, or rather rooted through these three locations, you know, which is the Canada, Singapore, and the uh, USA part of it there, altogether giving us almost 60% of the total investments there. But uh, Hong Kong is kind of increasing more with the Chinese investments coming through the Hong Kong route over there, so which is where we find that uh, you know this will be a going to be an increasingly growth trend from a sector's point of view there. Lastly, in terms of you know where is this investment going in, uh, you know so from a uh, the sector sub segments point of view, uh, you know the residential uh, continues to have almost 23 percent of this entire share, but the uh, the change in the investment uh, sizes, if you look at it, in terms of the uh, last year versus the uh, the last previous two three years over there, so there is a drop in the residential investment by 15 percent. Uh, overall share remains to be 23 percent of the total investment. Office. Uh, you know, share has now 47% of the total investment that has happened in the last four years. 
and uh, in that the office share investment has grown up as well by 8% over there so uh, in terms of while the investments are happening uh, across the other sectors as well sub sector in terms of the warehouses and retail side of it but residential and office continue to dominate you know the former investment size which is close to almost 75% over there so uh, you know with this uh, the investment story uh, continues to be intact you know from at least from the office and retail point of view one will have to watch out and see the space in terms of the fact that because there's always a lag between the supply and the uh, actual requirement so uh, does office continue to have that requirement coming up you know because there's a lot of now supply plant so as the supply comes up will that offtake happen that time that is where some judicious balancing is required uh, because we've seen this trend earlier as well you know wherein you had lot more office supply coming in in 2010 11 12 you know where we had to refix those projects and get into the residential side of it. So again, there is a need to pause and reflect to see that how the economy is doing, how the investments are coming up, which which area, which locations, and what kind of supplies required, and what type of segment that one is trying to attract over there. That would determine the investment size from a, uh, both the investors' point of view as well as from a developers' point of view there. So with this, uh, thank you very much for this time. Michelle. Thank you so much, Mr. Bonson.